All right, good afternoon, everybody. Um, welcome to what realtors need to know about homes with well water. <clears throat> um, I'm Steve Wilson. I work at the Illinois State Water Survey and manage the private well class. Uh, we're at the University of Illinois. Um, I want to mention first off that um, last month I had COVID and I've had a persistent cough since then. Um, and so if I mute myself for a few seconds here and there, it's because I have to cough and it's been really hard to stop from doing that. And so I apologize in advance. Um, if I talk for an hour and a half or two hours, I guarantee you this is going to happen. Um, this uh, webinar is sponsored by the private well class which is really sponsored, funded, and supported by uh, the Rural Community Assistance Partnership and US EPA. It's a grant that RCAP gets from US EPA um, to provide support to well owners and uh, teach them about taking care of their wells and source water protection. And so that's the uh, impetus, if you will, for developing the class we have, as well as these webinars. All right, so thanks for joining us today. <clears throat> um, as I mentioned, this is part of a program um, implemented through RCAP. It's nationwide. And um, our website, privatewellclass.org, is uh, where you can get the 10 lessons. You can take one a week for 10 weeks. You sign up for that. And I'll talk about that uh, near the end. Um, also, this webinar is being recorded, as all our other webinars have been. Um, we're up to 90 or so. And they're available on our YouTube channel. So if Anybody wants to see this one or the one we did last year, there'll be different questions today at the end. Um, you know, when you signed up and registered for this uh, webinar, you were taken to a page where you could ask questions. Um, we'll answer probably 10 or 12 or 14 of those that we got. We can answer them all. Um, but then um, that part of the webinar is always different. And so um, as well, during the presentation today, <clears throat> if questions come up for you. Um, Katie's monitoring the chat box and the question box on your GoToWebinar window, and you can ask questions there, and uh, we'll track those during the webinar today, and we'll pull those up at the end and, and go through them um, for as long as we need to. So um, this, these materials do follow our course, but the, the class is much more thorough. It's um, 10 lessons over about 80 pages of material. It's a PDF sent to you once a week for 10 weeks, and I encourage you, if you haven't um, taken the class, uh, to sign up with your email and do that. As far as NEHA, our NEHA guidelines, um, NEHA is a National Environmental Health Association, and our webinars are provided uh, for CE credit for CE or for EHPs that are NEHA members or any EHP. Uh, environmental health professional um, whose state accepts NEHA credit. And NEHA is a national organization. They have about 15,000 members and uh, they represent the environmental health uh, profession. And so uh, their credentialing cycle is two years. And so if you are a, uh, in a NEHA person, um, you understand all that. But we have done this webinar twice in the last two years. Uh, they're down in the lower left corner, right corner. And so um, you know, as it shows here, if you take it today, you won't be eligible to take it again until your credentialing cycle uh, restarts. And so if that just started, it'll be two years. And we're also an Illinois LEHP provider um, for Illinois licensure and Illinois sanitarians <clears throat> and EHPs. And so um, you can email us at info at .org, um, to request that information. And you know, what Katie does, Katie Buckley is, uh, I'll mention her in a second here, but um, she looks to see who's attended and the time they were on and how attentive they were. And, and we do have requirements. You can't just show up for five minutes and leave and, and then email us for a, although that rarely happens, I will be, uh, to be fair. Okay, so getting on to uh, first about RCAP, who they are. Um, if you work with well owners and ever wanna put on a workshop for your well owners, um, or um, work with a, you know, a local health department or local health district or extension or anybody else as a realtor um, to provide more resources for well owners. Um, RCAP in their six regions, which are these are the six regional affiliates, um, work in every state 
Um, we have a team of private well professionals, uh, some from each of these regions, as well as uh, our team here at the U of I. And uh, not only do they put on webinars, or well, they do put on webinars, workshops locally and work with lo in local areas, but they also uh, can do these well assessments, which is free of charge. It's funded by US EPA. Uh, for them to come out, it's a pretty comprehensive review of a well, the area, uh, geology, um, to look at what might be vulnerable about a well, um, how if it's, you know, if it has a proper well cap, all those sorts of things. And if you uh, are interested in finding out more about that, you can email us at info@privatewellclass.org or listed their information here, depending on what state you're in. Like I'm in Illinois, so we're part of the Great Lakes Community Action Partnership uh, RCAP office, if you will. <clears throat> Sorry. Um, so I'm at the Illinois State Water Survey, which most people that, uh, even in Illinois, a lot of folks don't know who we are, but because um, we're unique in that, you know, every state has a state geological survey, but there's only one other state that has a state water survey as well, which is very similar in uh, practice, except it's focused on water instead of geology. And the Illinois State Water Survey was formed in 1895 because of cholera and typhoid outbreaks. It started in the chemistry department at the University of Illinois, which is where this uh, nice uh, statue thing is. And uh, since then we've grown, um, we have sections on groundwater, surface water, atmospheric sciences, the state climatologist is here. Uh, we have a lab that um, until recently provided free water analysis for any well owner in Illinois. Now there's a charge for that, uh, like everything else. Um, and we do a lot of applied research helping the communities in the state and nationally uh, with water problems and issues, water quality and quantity. And so it's a, it's mostly applied research organization, but we also house the state's well logs. And so folks can call us and they do regularly asking questions about their well or if they're gonna put in a new well and we give advice on um, all those sorts of things. And um, yeah, it's, a, it's actually a pretty great place to work. We get to do a lot of cool stuff and help a lot of people. Just some old photos. Um, I'm involved, I'm part of the information and data services group and so um, we're currently trying to archive all of our old information. This is from 1913, a young man helping a water survey chemist sample wells in New Athens, Illinois. Uh, this is a typhoid outbreak. I've shown this in the past. That happened in 1916 in Pena, Illinois. The water survey investigated why it occurred and um, helped solve the problem. It turned out it was a Pena ice cream company, which also sold milk. And they had one large tank that everyone used one bucket to scoop milk out to take home and that uh, tank became contaminated with typhoid. And so uh, a lot of folks got sick. And um, yeah, it's all the way back in 1916. And these paper files are still in our records. You can, if you come into the survey to look at records for say, Payne, Illinois, you can find all of these materials and there's a lot to go along with the story. Uh, we sampled a lot of wells. You know, there used to be these common wells in, uh, in the early 1900s. Uh, in parks and things like that with, you know, you see the tin cup on the bottom there, certainly a public health risk. These things were certainly not chlorinated. Um, you can see their standing water um, and those were eventually outlawed um, by the state legislature in Illinois. So just a little bit about who we are and what we do. I mentioned uh, I'm a groundwater hydrologist at the state water survey and head of the environmental public health information and data services group. And Katie Buckley uh, is part of our wa private well class program. She's a water resources outreach specialist. And so today, if you have questions that you put in the question box or a chat box, Katie's gonna be uh, monitoring those and adding those to a list that we'll show, share at the end. And also uh, info at privatewellclass.org, um, those requests go to Katie and she will help uh, get certificates to everyone and, and answer questions you might have about today's webinar. So today we're really gonna talk about issues that are important to home buyers and sellers. Um, well construction basics, basic water quality information, things that you should know as a realtor, uh, especially uh, about private wells. And I'll probably say this more than once, but one of the best things you can do, if, if you work a lot uh, with homes that are on private wells, you should take our class and understand the basics of uh, private well stewardship and, and the issues you could have. And um, it'll help you in your business. It'll help you when you talk to well owners and homeowners, as well as buyers uh, and sellers. So, um, and at the end, we will go through a number of the questions we received in advance 
uh, advance. And so, um, and really good questions this time. I got to say, there were a lot of them were very different than we've had recently. So it makes it honestly more fun for me to answer those sorts of things. So um, some interesting questions today. So the important things to remember for a private well owner, and this is mostly true throughout the country, private wells are not regulated. Um, there is no standard testing like a community water supply. Um, some are regulated, or they're certainly regulated when they're constructed, but after that, you're on your own. And in a few states, if you sell your property with a well, then there are regulations you have to follow and testing that has to be done, but it's few and far between. So it's really up to you as the owner or the user to be sure the water's safe and drink, uh, safe to drink, and that you, the system's maintained. And so as a realtor, understanding, uh, you should be able to tell right away if someone's got a quote, good well, or a quote, you know, questionable well, just by looking at it, understanding, asking if they've ever sampled, some of those things. And as far as sampling goes, you know, a lot of folks, especially in the country, I grew up in the country on an old dug well, um, they swear the water tastes better than city water, all those things, but contaminants can be colorless, odorless, and have no taste. So the only way to know for sure if your well is safe or the well water is safe to drink is to test. And I'll go over that today uh, during the presentation. And you know, now I live in a community of uh, 150,000 residents or so, and I pay, and I, I leave this slide up, 40 to $50 a month. You know, I have an 11 year old daughter and I can't remember the last time our water bill was only 40 or $50 a month, but that's what it used to be. And so, um, and that's so that when I turn on my tap, I know my water's safe. I always have pressure. Um, there are no concerns uh, for me drinking that water because it's been tested and there's a licensed water operator and a, a system behind all that um, to maintain it, make sure the infrastructure's safe. And as a well owner, that's all of, um, that's all your own responsibility or that's a well owner's responsibility. A lot of folks prefer to be on a private well and want to have their own independence, but a lot of folks then also do not understand the risks or why it's important to be a good steward of their well. And that's kind of what our message is to, to everyone. Um, so you need to make sure your client understands the issues that come with owning a well, you know, poor construction, poor water quality. Um, not only are they a health risk, but they can reduce the value of a home. Um, and they can be expensive. And so it's really important um, to have an understanding of those things. Is it an old dug well or an old board well that's got a wooden cap? And, you know, I run into these all the time still. Um, you know, snakes, rats, you name it, we found them in wells. And if you're, that's for the seller, if you're the buyer, you need to protect yourself. Um, you're buying a property. If it turns out your water's no good and you can't use it, then all of a sudden you're going to have a heck of a time selling your property. Um, and so, and as well as public health protection, which I mentioned, um, you're taking on a responsibility as the buyer uh, to maintain that. Um, and maybe you plan to live there the rest of your life, but um, things change. And so, um, and you also, it's not just you. I just explained to a well owner who has an 11 foot deep well, and it was no surprise when we tested it, they had coliform bacteria. And I said, he, and his family's used to drinking it, so none of them get sick from it. But I said, do you ever have your kids ever have any uh, their friends over, or do you ever have any family or friends over to for supper or whatever? Um, they're going to get sick if they're, you know, because it's when you have coliform, it means there could be E. coli or other things, and it means your well's not properly protected at the surface. And so again, take our class; it'll help you understand all those issues. <clears throat> Um, so I want to talk about a few states that actually have more rigorous rules than the than the rest of us. So the first one to do anything, uh, especially on a state scale, was New Jersey. And so if you're familiar with the Private Well Testing Act, they require that a state person uh, comes out and collects a water sample for every property transfer. And uh, by doing that, they collect over 13,000 samples a year. And uh, that's been going on for close to 20 years. And so the state of New Jersey has an amazing resource of data on where natural occurring contaminants like radium, arsenic, some of those things occur. Um, they also understand, um, you know, the health risks for certain areas based on how shallow the wells are and all those things. You can get on their website and you can look at maps of areas where there's certain contaminants. Um, they protect the individual well owners, um, only the buyer and the seller 
um, are given the actual data for that well. They show everything like on a grid uh, so that they're not showing individual wells. Um, but they're important to know their law has worked really well. And when everybody complained and said, oh, no, this is going to slow down property transfer and this is going to make everything not work, none of that happened. And so, um, and there may have been a few bumps that I'm not aware of from 20 years ago. Um, but all in all, it's a really great program as far as protecting both the buyer and seller. And then what that leads to is um, being proactive instead of reactive in a lot of cases, which is what we encourage certainly sellers to do. Um, so there's a couple other states um, and there's a Q&A on their website. You can go look uh, if you're uh, working in New Jersey, but there's a lot of good information there. Um, Oregon is another state that requires testing during a real estate transaction and the Rhode Island. And Rhode Island's actually is unique um, than the other two. And I think there's one other state, it might be Connecticut, um, because they've tied their this law to, um, I believe, a home inspector. And so I think if, if a contaminant's found, it has to be remediated or they have the ability to condemn the property is not fit. And so it's really important that, you know, they want to make sure that whoever is buying the property, that's all taken care of and that the, they're drinking safe water because it's a it's a real issue. My son rented a property out in the country near here in, in Illinois and it was an old dug well. I sampled it. He didn't want to and his landlord didn't want to. And it certainly and it had he had coliform. And so um, I went to the county health department and they said they could try to talk to the landlord, but there's no law that requires them. Uh, to do anything, although they said they would try to convince the landlord that it makes the property unfit to live in without safe water. And so, but there's no law out there for that. So this is a unique law. And then we also started to see local jurisdictions starting to adopt water testing laws. Uh, this is New York, Westchester County. Um, they require um, sampling at property transfer uh, there's a number of local health districts in Massachusetts and I think in Connecticut where they've passed their own rules. And so um, the problem is that third bullet there, um, what that leads to is you can cross the road. You can buy a house on one side of the road and you've got all these rules to follow. And on the other side of the road, there aren't any because it's a different health district and they haven't uh, developed any laws locally for themselves. And what that leads to is unequal health protection. So it shouldn't matter which side of the street I live on, whether I'm protected or whether it's safe or whether I have to do extra work or whatever you want to look at it, it should be equal and fair for everyone. Our, our job should be to make sure that everyone's protected and the water they're drinking safe. <clears throat> so um, whether you represent the buyer or seller, you should do an inspection of the well and the water system. You should test the drinking water and inform your client and be informed about what the results are. If you're the seller doing those things in advance if say you have natural occurring arsenic we have some in our area here adding treatment in advance and remediating that um, or at least making those options uh, aware to the anyone who might be buying um, give you some room for negotiating um, if you've remediated it and you can show a test that shows that it's safe to drink uh, it gives a buyer much more confidence that yeah you know we're treating the water we just have to maintain the equipment and um, yeah, and if you're the buyer, um, you know, I, I mentioned this several times today probably. Um, to me, I tell everyone it's buyer beware. Don't buy a property if you haven't tested the water if it's a private well. If you do, you're taking a risk that one, you're gonna have to add treatment, um, which may be costly to install and maintain, um, but you also then don't know enough about the well, um, whether or not there's some other problem like you know, is there a breach in the casing so that bacteria are getting in or you just don't know where someone, if they've been diligent and done sampling on their own, you know that they care about their water and they've taken care of it. And that gives you more confidence as the buyer uh, going into the transaction. So we're going to talk about geology for a little bit. There's three types of wells. And the first is a board or dug well. If you can see underneath the platform where those two gentlemen are standing, um, there's a big hole in the ground and that's the bucket that's dropping the dirt out there. It's a three foot or three and a half foot diameter hole. Um, a board well is large, that's what they're doing. This is a boring machine. It bores down a three and a half foot, uh, foot hole uh, till they get to pass the water table or they hit a couple sand lenses. 
So usually put in a board well or a dug well where there's no aquifer available. So, but they're shallow, unconsolidated material, you know, clay, silt, and sand, uh, like in this case. Um, it always bothers me, this photo, because they're in bean stubble, um, and being a Midwesterner, um, putting a well, a shallow well, out in a field that gets chemicals applied to it and nitrate applied to it, if it's, you know, when it has corn or anything else on it, doesn't seem like a great idea, to be honest. So uh, the concrete tile, like you have running under the road for a small stream, you know, the con concrete pieces that are four foot long and three and a half foot diameter or three foot diameter, you just stack those on top of each other and water can come in at each of those seams. And so then, um, you know, it depends on how deep the water table is, how much volume you need. But the whole point of a large diameter well, whether you hand dig it like my grandpa did, he dug our well in 1933, or a board well with a boring machine like this that meets current well construction code is you're trying to store a volume of water because water seeps in slowly to the well. There's not an aquifer that'll continually replenish your well that quickly. And so you're trying to store water uh, so that in the morning there's water, whenever you take a shower, uh, it can start to fill back in during the day. And then at night when you're using it for you know dishes and uh, laundry and all those things, um, you still have water available. And that's, you know, on our well, uh, on a hot summer day, we had livestock. If I left a, a hose in our, our, our tank, our cattle tank, um, and forgot about it, will this really happen? We, we might be without water for two or three days because it takes that long for it to, to, to seep back in and, and fill up. And so a dugger board well is large diameter, and again, they're meant to store water. That's what you need to know. They come in all kinds of shapes and sizes. Um, most common one is probably the one on the right. It's a three, that's the, you can see the concrete tile and it's got a concrete lid. You have to use a breaker bar or a pry bar to get the lid off. And um, then inside you'll see uh, all the wiring and piping and it's underground to the house. The one on the upper left is an old hand dug well. Um, you know, this is a well we actually sampled for pesticides and nitrate as part of a study back in the 90s. But it's on a slope. The reason it's muddy around there and those posts are all worn down is because it's a cattle pasture. So the cattle are coming up and rubbing on those posts as back scratchers, as well as doing their business there. And that's uh, very likely seeping into the shallow ground there where it's gonna get into this well. Um, I can't remember this well is less than 20 feet deep. Um, I can't remember the exact depth, but it's on a side of a hill, right above that is a field. So there's chemicals applied, all those things. It's really a really poor spot and it's poorly protected. You know, there's two by tens and two by fours with some tin on top of that with concrete blocks and, and rocks holding it down. Um, snakes, rats, sometimes larger critters can get in there. Uh, definitely um, gonna test positive for coliform if not E. coli and other things. And the one on the bottom is really just like the one on the right, except the wide part, the three and a half or three foot diameter part doesn't start until 10 feet. So there's a pipe down uh, with a hole in that concrete top that you're seeing on the right. And so it looks like a normal drilled well. And that's really so that you can minimize the amount of area um, above the well that is, um, you can put clay till or concrete or things that are gonna not allow water to seep straight through. And so it's just meant to be better protection. And so here's how those two look. Um, if you have a well board, the one on the right is the one with that looks like a regular well cap at the top with a you know a six inch uh, that says four inch diameter casing in the image, but then there is a concrete pad or concrete seal down uh, ten feet or more, and so you're putting clean earth fill they said here, but you know till or concrete you can put uh, things in there that are that resist water moving through them, um, and then you've got the lower part where you can see the little triangles where the water table is, and so water seeps in in those joints. You have a pump down there and you're pumping water up. On the left, this is where the concrete uh, tile comes all the way to the surface. Um, you know, this shows that the pipe comes out of the top. That's not typical. Usually it's like the one on the left where there's just a hole in the concrete or on the right where there's a, a pitless adapter um, and it, it actually goes to the house to the pressure tank below ground level. And the reason for a pitless adapter is uh, so that you can, uh, your pipes won't freeze. If you run it out the top and you're in a cold climate, um, like our dug well, the pump was right, right on top of the well, basically in a little well house. If our power went out and the heat to that little well house went out, we froze our pipes. 
Uh, and so, and then, you know, they'll bust, uh, you can't get water then, and uh, or the lines freeze altogether. So these aren't ideal um, because they're shallow and you're getting water a lot of times from uh, near the surface. And depending on the soil type, uh, there could be a lot of infiltration that allows uh, water that could be carrying contaminants down uh, to uh, your well. And that's where we see the most problems with water quality. So the other type are sand and gravel wells. And these are uh, finished in a sand and gravel aquifer, which, um, you know, sand has a porosity of about 30%. So if I had a jar of sand, full of sand, about 30% of that is actually air. And so when it's saturated, like it would be in the ground, then that 30% is actually water. And so a 100 foot sand and gravel aquifer that's fully saturated has 30 feet of water in it. So it's a really uh, productive aquifer. Uh, you can, a lot of irrigation wells are in sand and gravel aquifers that pump over a thousand gallons a minute. And the idea here is you have a well screen, which is what this picture is. That's a woven single piece of stainless steel wire and it's slotted, those, those little slots in there are based on the actual cuttings you bring up when you're drilling the well. So the screen size or the size of the, the slots in that are based on how big the sand particles are. If you have finer sand, it's woven tighter and you can order screens uh, with different diameters for the slots. Um, if you're in gravel where the slots are a lot bigger, um, you, you know, allows more water through. But the idea, it's no different than the screen on your door. Um, a screen on your door keeps the bugs out and lets the air in. A screen on your well lets the water in and keeps the sand uh, or material, soil material. And so um, typically with a sand and gravel well, it's solid casing from the surface down to the screen. And the screen for a home well is usually the last four to six feet. And that's it. So if I have a 200 foot sand and gravel well, likely it's solid pipe to say 195. And then the last five feet is a screen. So the only place water can come in the well is at the screen, that 195 to 200 feet distance below land surface. So in that case, that's fairly well protected from the surface and surface influences as long as when you're sealing, putting the well in, you know, the outside between the size of the hole and the size of the well casing is called the annulus. And you fill that in with grout, which is a clay grout or concrete, a type of cement uh, that doesn't allow water to move through it. And so you have to grout the well, and that's according to almost every state's code, so that you um, are protecting it from surface influence running down the outside of the casing, down to the screen. So here's the log. This is a really nice log. This company in Illinois has their own, developed their own little computer program um, so that they can put all this in and print it out. And it looks very similar to the log that's Illinois Department of Public Health requires, um, but it tells you a lot of information. So um, you can see over on the left side that it's PVC. Um, it's the hole they drilled was eight and three quarter inch diameter. They drilled a 295. Um, you know, it's got a, uh, they estimate the yield at 40 gallons per minute, which is a really good well. Most homes only need five. Uh, and as far as a pump capacity, they put in a 15 gallon per minute pump, which is also, um, they must have livestock or something because usually you wouldn't put in one that big. It's got an eight gallon pressure tank, which today I realize a lot of pressure tanks are small, um, not like they used to be. And then you get on the, on the right side, it tells you all the information about where it's at. Um, and well logs in Illinois are public information, so these uh, are available. Um, but it, SDR 21 for the material, that's a type of PVC. Um, and then five foot of stainless steel screen at the bottom. And so that's from, or four foot, it says a oh, five inch diameter. Yeah, they have a four foot screen from 291 to 295. And then down at the bottom of that, you can see the geology. It talks about there being uh, clay to 260. And then some tight sand, that's the fine sand on top, and then sand and then sand and gravel. You know, sand like anything else, um, if you think about a sandbar on a river, um, whenever all the sand was deposited, it, when the glaciers were melting, uh, the biggest particles fall out first. So the deeper you go through the sand, you expect the particles to get larger, which is why at the bottom it's sand and gravel. And at the top, at 260 to 285, they called it, quote, tight sand. Um, because it's real fine and that's it's actually tougher to drill through and, and, and work with. Um, one thing I neglected to mention right above that, the static water level is 159 feet below land surface 
And when they pumped it at 20 gallons per minute, it only went to 165. So they had six feet of drawdown, um, pumping at 20 gallons a minute, and they're only putting in a 15 gallon per minute pump. Uh, they don't say how many hours, but it's likely an hour that they pump this. Um, I think that's the minimum. And here we're in a, a fairly thick aquifer that's um, really extensive. And so it's, uh, you know, they knew going in that they were going to have a lot of water available. So this is the backside of that form. And again, this is why it's really nice. Uh, they use this program, um, but it kind of shows you what this all looks like. Again, it shows the log on the right, uh, topsoil, brown clay, all that stuff. Uh, all the pertinent information you need, even the location. And again, this is all public information. So, but it's a visual diagram basically. Um, and I don't remember, they, oh, they have 180 foot of drop pipe and then the pump. Um, so they put it down to 180 knowing that they'll probably never have water levels drop that low. But the other nice thing there is you could drop that pump down if something changed in the area and all of a sudden water levels were to drop, say a large irrigation system went in nearby and at least during the summer water levels got a little lower, um, you can always drop the pump down further. Uh, you don't ever put the pump in the screen, but you could put it down at say 200 and you'd have uh, plenty of water. Okay, so the third type of well is a bedrock well. And so the difference here is that when you drill, uh, so what this is showing in the diagram is the colored stuff on top is called the overburden and saturated overburden, there's a water table. That can be clay, it could even be kind of sandy, but it's not an aquifer. And so they're drilling through that material to get to bedrock. And you know, water doesn't exist in rock, it exists in the cracks and fissures in the rock. So when you drill a bedrock well, you're trying to hit cracks and openings and that's where your water is going to come from. Um, and so in this diagram, you can see if you look at the casing, it stops 10 to 20 feet below the rock level. So what you typically do is you put in, a, you're drilling a well under bedrock. You drill much deeper. Say you drill the same 200 feet, but it's 30 feet to bedrock. And then you might put it in 20 more feet. You stop the casing at 50 feet. The rest of that hole, the rock itself is the casing. And the reason you do that is so that every fracture you hit is connected to that hole where you're going to put your pump and you can pull water. If you case it all the way down, you'd case off all that. Like this shows one of the, those little lines are the fractures. One of the fractures is above the casing. It's not contributing to the well, uh, except through, you know, like a piping system. If uh, it can flow down through and get to another fracture that's lower. So, there's two things about a bedrock well. One, it really depends on where the bedrock starts and how much casing you have, because that same 200 foot well, um, I ran across some wells in New York State when I was working there where um, they had 600 foot wells, but it only had 25 feet of casing. So if there are any fractures coming up to close to the surface uh, and they're influenced by surface water, then they're gonna be able to get into that well because there's only 25 feet of casing protecting it. So that same, you know, the example I used before with the sand and gravel well has solid casing to 195 feet. The only place water can get in a sand and gravel well is in the screen. Whereas in a bedrock well, most of it's usually an open hole so it can capture those fractures and use them for water supply. And it also depends on how many fractures you have. Um, if you only hit one fracture, that's your entire water supply. Um, it means that your water could be coming from a, a larger distance away than it would be in a sand and gravel well. Usually it's, you know, quote, local water very near the well that's filling in and replacing the water you're pumping. But in a bedrock well, it's, it's almost like there's a couple pipes connected to your, your well that could go over a long distance in those fractures. So hopefully that's clear. Um, and this is a bedrock well. This is a camp um, in, uh, up in the Chicago area, McHenry County. And I won't go through all the other stuff, but if you look at number 15, it says there's a uh, five inch diameter PVC from one to 179 feet, and then black steel from 179 to 199. And that's because they, they put a, a, a piece on the end of that of steel piece to seat it in the bedrock and make it a solid fit. And so if you did that PVC, you'd break it. It's just not strong enough. And so they used uh, the cheaper material, the PVC, uh, down to 179, then connected uh, with a 20 inch, 20 foot piece of steel pipe um, and seeded that in the bedrock. And now if you look down at the log, number 18, they hit limestone at 189. Um, 
And so they put the steel casing 10 feet into the bedrock, right? So the well's 260 feet deep, but from 199 to 260, there's no casing. It's just the open borehole that you drilled through the rock. And again, that's to take advantage of those fractures. And they did hit fractures because number 17 says the static level is 130 feet and the pumping level uh, went to 160 feet when pumping at 25 gallons a minute for two hours. You know, this is for a camp. So they need to be sure they had plenty of water, uh, whatever the capacity that camp might have been. I don't know if it's a Boy Scout camp or some other kind of camp. Um, but they it dropped to 160, but you still have 100 feet of well there and you can drop your pump lower if you needed to. And so um, that's the difference. So well type does matter. So again, with a Duggar board well, there's really, there's no quote real aquifer or a lot of times they're very old. It turns out where I grew up, there's an aquifer at about 80 feet, sand and gravel aquifer, but my grandpa didn't know that. And so um, he put in an old hand dug well in a ravine and uh, that's what we used um, and they still do. So uh, sand and gravel well is usually drilled or driven and the same a, dr um, a bedrock well, a consolidated rock is bedrock. Uh, those are usually drilled. There's different type, types of rigs and some of those things that aren't important, but really those are the three types of wells you're gonna run across. And uh, you know, in some, like I said, some cases you may have choices. Um, if you're in a glacial environment like uh, the northern two thirds of Illinois, there's sand and gravel aquifers near the surface, but you can drill down into bedrock. Some of those are potable water and some aren't. In southern Illinois, the bedrock there is it's an old inland sea, and so it's salt water, and so it's really not uh, drinkable uh, without treatment. And so there's very little. Um, groundwater used in the southern third of Illinois because of that, except in some of the shallow alluvial aquifers along river bottoms where there might be sand and gravel. It's important to know the differences. It matters where your water's coming from, especially with a dug well or a board well. Um, they're likely to be much shallower and closer to the surface, surface and meant to capture water from the water table. And that's water that's seeping from the ground, uh, from the surface down in. And that's potentially uh, might have other contaminants that um, a deeper well may not have. Um, it's best if there's a log so you know where the water might be coming from um, and that information. The problem is um, well logs weren't required for a long time uh, in the United States and it's a state-by-state -state thing. In Illinois we passed a law in 1968 to require uh, well logs to be filed and the geology to be described and in New York it was the year 2000. Um, in some states like Mississippi if you drill a five inch or less diameter well, you don't have to file a log. And so there's a lot of areas where there aren't many logs, even though there's a lot of wells. And so uh, those differences all depend on the state. You know, there's two states that still don't have, uh, don't require, well, uh, don't have well construction code that require a uh, well to be drilled to certain specifications, nor do they license drillers. And so anyone can put in a well any way they want. And, uh, you know, that's that's the state legislature in those states issue that uh, the rest of us have to deal with. OK, so as far as poor construction, um, one thing that is a constant in every state is as construction, well, construction codes change as people learn more and they change the code and make it improve it and all those things. Any well that's already in existence doesn't have to meet that code. They're grandfathered in. So the well, you know, the well my grandpa hand dug in 1933 is still a usable well because it doesn't have to meet our current code um, because it was already installed before that. And so codes have changed in the last 30 plus years or 40 years, but it's a matter of knowing when that well was drilled, what the code was then, if there's a log, all those things. So many wells, you know, in the old days were put in pits because they're before they invented the pitless adapter because by putting the well down in a pit, let's say you're in an area where the frost line is two feet in the winter, if your pit's deeper than that, then your pipes won't freeze. But if it's you don't have it in a pit and the pipes come out of the ground and it's a cold day, you might freeze your pipes. And so we still see wells that are in pits, which are really dangerous. And we also still see a lot of hand dug wells that are still in use. And uh, not only are those a problem because, you know, if you have this pit and it's not properly uh, protected, a big rainstorm, it's going to fill up with water. And if it overtops your well, unless your well cap is perfectly sealed and the vent cap is 
perfectly the way it's supposed to be, you're going to get water in your well for surface water, and you're likely to get some contamination from that. And so, and it's also a safety hazard. Those things, a lot of times we see with a piece of plywood over top of them, and I'll show you some examples. Um, so here we go. So the picture on the left is um, this person had has a little well house and they had a piece of plywood over the top of their well, but you can see, I mean, this is in disarray before she fell and, and it killed her. Um, the pump sitting there, there's, it looks like insulation along on the floor uh, for the, from the walls, it's disintegrating down on the floor. All that's fallen in, I guarantee you there's uh, rodents. Um, there's a, a little uh, siphon or funnel there for probably putting oil in the pump. Uh, just a really poor situation. And then the picture on the right is a dead goat. And this was in an old well in Southern Illinois. They put a piece of concrete tile into the well, even though you can see down at the bottom, those are old bricks and old pieces of stone. And this, but it wasn't covered in the, the, oh, uh, the, concrete tile only came up about a foot and a half. And so um, a goat fell in it one day looking for water, who knows what. But, um, you know, we've had people tell us their water smelled funny and we find frogs or snakes in their well, all kinds of things that can happen. And I do want to mention that Washington State Department of Ecology is the state agency in Washington state that regulates drillers and well construction. And I don't know if they still do, but they used to have a blog and that's where this picture came from, where they put up pictures and I have one more I'm going to show in a minute um of these kind of situations just to make people more aware uh, of how risky it really is and how dangerous it can be so what do you do with these wells try to bring them up to code find out what the code is in your state um, it'll you know put a proper cap on it sometimes it's a matter of filling in that large diameter well and drilling a hole through the middle of it putting a uh, a deeper well in um, if you have to do that uh, we've seen that happen before where some of these wells will go dry and so they've just decided they have to put in a new well and they put it right in the same hole, uh, basically. Um, extend the pipe up to land surface if you're in a pit, you know, fill that whole thing with clay grout so that it can't have water seeping in around it. And if it doesn't have a pit, let's put in the pitless adapter. But there's a lot of people you can talk to locally, uh, your well drillers, your county, um, uh, you know, well contractor uh, extension um, or your university extension. Um, or even your state geological survey or an Illinois state water survey um, to find out uh, what issues you might have and how to deal with that. So the same thing with abandoned wells. I know someone asked about abandoned wells. Um, since well logs weren't required until the 60s to 80s in most states, and again, 2000 in New York, there's as many wells not on file as there are wells that are on file. And, you know, when someone buys an old property in the country and they tear down the old house and build a new one, a lot of times they decide they'll keep that old dug well for their garden, but they're going to put in a new well for their drinking water. And they end up not using that. It goes, they forget about it. Um, you hear all kinds of stories of abandoned wells out in the middle of the country or in the middle of where they, you wouldn't think there'd be anything. And uh, someone falls in or livestock fall in or whatever. But just like pits, they're a safety hazard and a source of contamination. And if you have an abandoned well on a property, um, it needs to be properly abandoned and sealed. Not doing so makes could make you responsible. Even if someone is not supposed to be on your property and they fall in and it kills them or they get injured, um, you're likely going to uh, be responsible for that. And it, uh, the other problem is, again, um, it can also contaminate the aquifer. Some people see those holes as a great place to throw things they don't want anymore. We, um, we did an abandoned well um, demonstration in um, Western Illinois, in Macomb, Illinois. Someone bought a house in town and found in their backyard they had an old dug well. Um, it was only 22 feet deep. They've had city water since 1916, and yet here's this old well sitting here. No one ever did anything with it. And it had a little three-inch hole in the top of the concrete pad, which was for a hand pump. And so um, they wanted to get rid of it. We did a demonstration working with the groundwater guardians and the, the Western University, Illinois University, and a couple well drillers, um, or one well driller, Gingrich out of Iowa. They, we filled it in. And when they opened up the cap, they found about, oh, I'd say at least 10,000 cigarette butts and a couple lighters down in the well. So the, who owned the property before saw that three inch hole 
and decided that'd make a great place to put my cigarette butts and anything I wanted to throw down there. Now, luckily, the aquifer that's used by the city isn't anywhere close to that. It's a really shallow well, but it just shows that people see that and they think it's a great place to uh, drop things in. So, uh, yeah, you just don't know. People like to bury things. Even my dad did that, buried stuff in the back on our property, and, you know, it's 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 really a dumb thing to do. So uh, two more pictures from Washington State Department of Ecology. One shows the horse that's in a well. They're trying to get it out. And the one on the bottom, um, this is, you know, data. It's nine years old, but it surprised me. The story here is that the guy fell 45 feet into this well, and when they got him up, he walked away, but he didn't get hurt. And so um, hopefully he realizes how lucky he really was because uh, you see a lot more stories like the ones in these newspaper clippings where, uh, you know, 10-year-old girl died from falling in an abandoned well. And the third one there, if you're old enough, you remember Jessica McClure. Um, I think CNN carried live for 20-some hours um, rescuers trying to get her out of this well in uh, Midland, Texas. And she's a, uh, an adult mother of three today, but um, she made national news. Uh, this is during the early 90s when... Uh, she fell in that well as a toddler. So it, it happens a lot of times in those days without the internet uh, in the early 90s or before, you didn't know about it unless you read it in the paper. Uh, nowadays, obviously with the internet, uh, a lot more of that information gets out, but it certainly does happen. Okay, so whether you re represent the buyer or the seller, do an inspection of the well and water system, it's so you're better prepared. You can make corrections beforehand. Um, so you're not surprised when someone uh, when the buyer hires someone to come out and do an inspection and they find stuff wrong, um, you know, that's, you don't want that, right? That's bad for your client. That's bad for the, the seller. And so it's better to make informed decisions. And um, we still run into all the time. I had someone call me a few weeks ago who was buying a property and the homeowner didn't want to let them take a water sample. Um, and I just told them they should walk away. Um, which is drastic. I realize, uh, but you, what else are they not telling you is my, what I said to them. And if you're the buyer, you know, you need to protect yourself from a health standpoint and a property value standpoint. So you need to uh, take care of those things. Um, this is from the state of Wisconsin. So Wisconsin actually has a very common sense law that says, we don't require you to do an inspection of the well, but if you're going to do an inspection, we require you to have a licensed well driller do it. It's not because they're trying to give the well drillers business. It's because they know what they're doing. And so, you know, it says here, if you read this notice, do not send forms to DNR. They're just trying to provide a standardized way for everyone to inspect wells in Wisconsin so that, like it says, inspections are voluntary. Um, but the idea here is they update this uh, transfer thing, this form, based on what their current constru construction code is. And the idea is the well drillers all know the well construction code because they're installing wells every day. And if there's something that doesn't meet the current code, so say it was put in 10 years ago, so it doesn't meet code today, they, there's a place on the bottom to identify that and basically tell them what kind of risk they might have. You know, here's what this means. Um, or you can at least ask, what does this mean? And so it's, it's really to be an informative piece for the uh, buyer. Um, and it's a great thing because you know, they don't want the paperwork. They're not going to get in the middle, but they're trying to provide a service here that says we're trying to protect anyone who's using a private well, especially buying one if they've not been on one before. Um, it's important to understand your well. So, and this is further down that page, and um, and by signing it, you know you've got some credibility there, all that sort of stuff. So. Um, yeah, it's actually a great way to do things. Also, every state, and I'm using Minnesota's because I think this diagram's great, um, has well construction code that you have to, I, if you're putting in a new well, these are the setback distances you have to use. Um, and this is just meant to be an example. Every state's got different values for some of these things, but it's pretty comprehensive about all the things some of you might not understand uh, would be a problem, but a lot of things really are. Um, you know, even like saying three feet from a building or a building overhang, um, we've run into wells where they have their well, it was in a pit, they fill that all in, 
um, everything's working fine and they decide they need a garage and they put it over top of their well. They pour concrete pad over top of their well. And these are homes with submersible, this, this well has a submersible pump. This really happened to me. Um, and so not understanding that their pump burns out or some other failure happens, that well is basically useless. They will have to drill a new one. There's no pulling the pump um, because, you know, and we've seen wells in kitchens, in basements, um, all kinds of different things. And so there's a lot of good reasons for some of these. And if you have vulnerable geology, in some cases, there'll be setbacks will be different. Um, or you may have to construct things in a certain way. But it's important to be familiar with what your state requires. Um, oh, did I go the wrong way? Oh, I guess I was just showing this is, you know, a lot of these things are listed here uh, that are on that list, um, whether it complies or not, and some of those things. So the next thing is test the water. If you're the seller, you might have to consider adding treatment. It's better to do that in advance. And if you don't have anything, if you can hand your water treatment results from a credible lab to the buyers, it shows that you've done your due diligence, that your water's safe, all those sorts of things. I mean, as a realtor, you should make that your standard practice. And, and that's just my opinion. Um, but if you're the buyer, again, it's buyer beware, protect yourself. And, um, you know, and when they do a test, if you, you know, some people uh, certainly do the wrong thing, right? And so if someone has a well that uh, maybe it's an old dug well that's very likely to have coliform or E. coli in it, um, they may disinfect their well when they know you're going to come out and do the uh, testing. And so we test for chlorine. It means it was recently disinfected. And, um, you know, it's important uh, to protect yourself. And unfortunately, those things happen. And I've got a good example of that later, not related to chlor um, bacteria, but arsenic. Um, so then why it's important, I don't, oh, I guess it's right now. So I don't want to know. Um, I was sampling a bunch of wells out in the country for a research project. We were trying to look at the spatial variability of arsenic. And um, I had a guy say, you can sample my well or my house uh, my outside spigot as long as you don't send me results and you do I'm not home. And I was like, well, why would you want to do that? And he said, well, I'm trying to sell my house. And in Illinois, there's a form you have to fill out and it's legally binding. And one of the questions is, is it do anything adverse about your water or your drinking water, or your septic? And he wouldn't be, honestly be able to answer that question. I do not know rather than get those results and learn that he might have arsenic and then have to do something about it. Uh, and that's, you know, an individual. Uh, he certainly has a right to be that way. It's not the way I think anyone should be but it's an example of uh, why it's important uh, because you just don't know for sure, especially if they if they say no on that form, that just means they don't know of anything. Doesn't mean that there is or isn't an issue. Um, why doesn't it say, okay, so the buyer beware one, um, another county in Illinois, I had a, a, a woman call me, she's got three kids. Um, when they tested her well, they only tested it for, I went, before she bought the property, they only tested it for coliform and nitrate, which is what, you know, that's a big mistake that people make thinking if you sample for coliform and nitrate and it doesn't have either, that means my well safe, it does not. And I'll explain that when we get to the, what we recommend you test for. But um, so three or four years later, she saw in the paper that there was some arsenic in some of the private wells in her area. So she had her well water sampled and she had 150 PPB of arsenic, which the standard is 10 for a public water supply. So she called me wondering why the state doesn't do more to protect her and her family. Mad as a wet hen at me, um, which we're not a regulatory agency and have nothing to do with it, but it just sells the point of, you know, it's buyer beware. You have to learn that stuff or you as a realtor need to help your clients understand those things before they actually buy the property. Because if any of those things happen, it leaves a bad taste in the buyer's mouth and they're likely one, not to use you again, um, if, if everything didn't go well with the sale. And I'm sure you've encountered that for a lot of reasons that weren't even your fault, but that's the way the world works. And so it's really important to try to do uh, your due diligence for your customer. And um, yeah. Um, so what do you test for? So it really, it does depend on a number of things, how deep the well is, if it's what kind of geology it's in, if there are any known contaminants, like we know there's areas, like if you go on New Jersey's website, their state website, you can see where they have radium issues or uranium or 
uh, or arsenic or things like that. Um, and I'll show you some examples uh, too. But um, I would always go to your county, local or state health department and ask them if there's anything in particular to sample for. And I'll give you some reasons for that in a minute. Um, but then once you've identified if there are any in your area, you can also ask uh, your state agency, state geological survey or USGS office, um, even ask neighbors, co-op extension, uh, local drillers, because they're going to tell you if there's anything in the area they know of. Uh, just like, you know, we have arsenic in Tazewell County. If you called the Tazewell County Health Department, they would say, number one, you need to test for arsenic because there's some pretty high arsenic values there. Um, it's kind of hit or miss, but um, you need to be sure what's in your well. And again, you're aware of this more than I am, but your lender likely has requirements, um, even if the state doesn't. And uh, so being informed, uh, again, means there's no surprises for anybody later. And you know, I had a person call me once saying, if we don't sign for this property today, there's three other people waiting to take it. And you know, what I said to them is, well, that's a decision you have to make. But understand if you know you you want the property that bad, you're accepting the risk that you may have to treat, put in a new well, um, or find an alternate water source. Uh, that's always those things are possible if you're not going to get a water sample collected. So, um, and as far as natural groundwater quality, investigate. You you know if you even get on the web, uh, you might be able to find a lot about natural water quality in your area. Um, your water resources agency, whether that's a DNR or a DEP or DEC, whatever it might be in your state, um, a lot of those folks have maps that show where there's certain kinds of contaminants. And um, and if you don't know who to contact, just Google my state water well logs. And if like if you do that for Missouri, you're going to get Missouri DNR, and you can find it's going to have a link to where you can look up logs. Same with Illinois, you might go to our state geological survey. I'm gonna show you an example of that. Um, but start with those folks. If they don't know anything about the water quality side of things because they're on the resources side, they will say, oh, we go to our state geological survey or, or go to our state EPA office or whatever. They can tell you about, you know, they mapped water quality for these things. And so once you have an idea of both health, there's two kinds of contaminants, right? There's nuisance based, which stain, smell, um, but have no health risk. And then there's health-based contaminants that, you know, actually cause health problems like arsenic. Um, you can find out what all those are and then you can um, make sure you test for them. And also, again, there's a lot of information online. And uh, yeah, and sometimes when you call a lab to do the testing, they may expect you to know what to test for. I tell people if a lab can't help you understand what you should test for, find a different lab. Um, because labs need to take a piece of this. So they're like the second most common place people call for advice or information about testing. And so they should have folks on staff that are able to help you. But um, include anything they recommend, it's worth it um, if it's possible. So a couple examples. There's a lot of arsenic and uranium in Massachusetts. They've mapped it, they know where it's at. So they created this tool MassDEP has where you can just put in your address and it'll tell you if you're at risk for arsenic or uranium in your well water. And this is for bedrock wells, which is most of what they have. Uh-oh, what did I do? That? Oh no, Katie. And Katie's gonna be mad at me because I forgot to take out a slide that moves on its own. Um, wow, I thought I got rid of those for a long time. But anyway, um, and then there's information up in the corner there. You can click on fact sheets about what that means, blah, blah, blah. blah. And then if we move on, this is uh, Rhode Island. And all those little dots are where there used to be orchards or they, there's known arsenic contamination from pesticides. That's not typically where you find arsenic. Arsenic is a common element in the Earth's crust. So we find it uh, throughout the country that has nothing to do with uh, an orchard. But until the 60s or so, most pesticides were arsenic based. And so they know there's a lot of these areas where the soil's contaminated and sometimes the shallow groundwater. But what's really interesting about this figure is that um, that big splotch in the middle is where there's natural occurring beryllium. And when I saw this on Rhode Island's website, it's probably been close to 10 years ago, I did not know beryllium was even a regulated contaminant. But it's part of the Safe Drinking Water Act that communities have to make sure there's not very much beryllium in your drinking water. And so because it does have health risks, 
And so, um, you know, it was eye opening for me because that's a really odd thing to find in groundwater. And I've been in the groundwater business for you know over 30 years. And so we don't have that here and in most places in the country, but they do. And so you'd need to know that in order to, if you're gonna live in one of these areas, right? And so, uh, and there's some states that have a little more advanced, like this is uh, Wisconsin. They've got this website that was put together by University of Wisconsin Stevens Point for Wisconsin DNR, which regulates well construction, which regulates community water supplies and private wells. So I searched, um, and I apologize. I thought I'd got rid of all that. Um, I searched for arsenic by county, and this is what came up. Um, and the three red counties that are by Green Bay mean that the average sample for a private well in that those counties is over 21. Uh, is 21 or over, which is, you know, the standard is 10 for a public water supply for the Safe Drinking Water Act. I keep saying that because the Safe Drinking Water Act does not apply to private wells. You aren't required to test, you aren't required to have a licensed operator, all those things that a community does. But the health-based standards that communities are required to meet are kind of a surrogate for what everyone should be trying to stay below in their private well water. So if you have arsenic over 10, you'd want to add treatment um, according to what EPA considers safe. You know, some people don't want any arsenic, so they're going to add more uh, treatment to reduce it even further. But this shows you and, you know, this this is actually an older slide. I think all these counties have been filled in. You know, there's four or five there that are clear. Um, and this has changed a little bit because as they collect more samples, this map can change some depending on what you're looking at. But it's an example of what's available um, if you just do a little uh, investigation on the web. Okay, so here's what we recommend. Um, and again, we we reach a national audience, so we aren't looking at some of those specific things like beryllium. You know, it's not something you'd recommend to most people. So you sample annually for coliform and nitrate, and you do that every year. You, coliform itself does not cause you to get sick. Nitrate doesn't cause adults to get sick, only causes problems for pregnant women and babies, right? Blue baby syndrome, uh, where their stomachs can't break down the nitrate and it forms nitrite, and it ends up taking over the oxygen uh, places in their blood, and so you can suffocate. So it's a risk there, it's why it's regulated. Um, but coliform isn't the bacteria that actually makes people sick, it's E. coli, um, which is another type of coliform bacteria. Um, but you test for those things because they're so common in the shallow environment. So if you have either of those in your well, you shouldn't have elevated nitrate or bacteria in your well, a uh, coliform bacteria. If you do, it means that there's a pathway into your well. So there's a crack in your casing, or you've got uh, an unsafe well cap, or it's like some of those we looked at where it's just um, boards on top of an old dug well. It's an indicator that your well has a pathway uh, into it from the surface, which means this time maybe you tested positive for, for coliform, but it could be something else much nastier that can still get into your well if, if you're not uh, sealing your well properly or have it make sure that it's safe from shallow influence. And so that's why coliform is an easy thing to test for. And if it's in there, that means other things can get in there. And a lot of times you'll see um, if you have coliform, you also have E. coli. But then as far as regular testing, um, these are the things we recommend um, listed here, you know, lead, uh, sulfate, pH, a lot of these things, uh, turbidity, they, they tell you something about, well, obviously arsenic and lead are a risk. Um, and lead, you know, we have a whole set of information on lead because lead is not a well issue. It's a uh, plumbing issue, right? You're not, in most cases, you're not getting lead from the well. You're getting lead from your pipes in your home. And so, um, but when you test, you should be testing your drinking water and so this is kind of a, this gives you a good general chemistry, allows you to do a mass balance on, on the chemistry if you have someone who can do that for you. And it just gives you a good idea of what kind of water quality you have. Also, it's a way to determine how corrosive or aggressive your water might be. Because if you have copper pipes or you have lead pipes or galvanized pipes, if your water is corrosive, you're gonna leach lead, copper, or you know zinc and cadmium. Um, 
but if it turns out it's not corrosive, then you can have lead pipes or copper pipes and it's not going to cause a problem. It's only if the water is scouring or, you know, uh, is taking those things from the pipes itself. So this is what we recommend in general. This is a list I'd start with and then determine if there's anything else you need to test for um, in your area. So uh, inform your client and be informed. Basically, provide them resources. Consider even having a web page. I'll show you an example. Um, if you, you know, a lot of folks don't market themselves as, you know, specifically working on uh, private well type of homes or whatever, but, um, you know, the more you know and can answer questions, the better you look, obviously. And so it's really worth not only taking our class, but also send your clients uh, to our class so that they understand some of the basics and realize that they have help if they need it. You know, we do as much to answer questions. Um, we get questions almost every day from someone around the country. And so um, it's important that they know that um, some people just walk away from a home that's on a private well because they just don't wanna have to deal with what they think it means. If they understand what it really means, a lot of groundwater is perfectly safe. And so they just need to, um, you know, to take that step and, and understand those things. Um, I would insist on inspection and sampling, even if not required. Uh, again, the benefit far outweighs the costs, um, both in the image it provides, um, it allows you to be progressive instead of reactive, all those things. And uh, you know, like I said at the bottom here, transparency and professionalism stand out and to help build reputation. So, um, yeah. I don't remember why I put the slide in here. I guess this is the other, um, I guess this is just show resources that are available, right? So some states have a really robust website and have a lot of information. Connecticut's done a great job. They put on a conference um, every year, every other year. Um, this is a, I think, oh, this is DNR in Wisconsin. And so they've got a lot of information available. Any question you can come up with, you know, driven point or sand points, that sort of thing. Um, all those things matter. And then this is a realtor in Colorado. Um, I'm not advocating for this particular realtor. I don't promote anyone, but it, it's a great example where they put some time in and put some information together to um, provide to their uh, their clients. So, um, so I wanna talk a little bit about, oh, sorry, wrong button. I wanna talk a little bit about the private well class. Um, again, it's a series of 10 lessons. You sign up online, it just asks for your first name, the state you live in, and your email address, and that's so they can we can send it to you. It's a PDF that comes once a week for 10 weeks, um, and it's not these webinars. As so many people, we ask people questions, you know, sometimes we'll put a thing in the chat or um, do a poll. We say, how, how many of you have taken the private well class lessons? And it's like five to 10% of the people on the webinar because a lot of people think these are the lessons and they're not. They're, um, they're really a short version of what you can learn uh, in the self-paced classes. And again, they're self-paced, so you can sit on them, you can read through them all multiple times, however you wanna do it, but it's information that you have at your uh, disposal what you do. And then we do a lot more than the class and the webinars. We podcast, videos, some other things, and then we also provide support, you know, we've already um, mention the info at privatewellclass.org and we do have a phone line where people can call us uh, and they do. And so this is a front page, take our free class, click on that and it takes you to this page where, again where it just asks for um, your email address, first name and the state you live in and really that's for us to put in our progress reports to EPA and RCAP to say yes we're covering the whole country. We've actually had people from um, at least 11 other countries who've taken our stuff and, and get reached out to us and things like that. And so it's been, uh, we've had over, a little over 10,000 people sign up for our class so far, which is great, and over 30 for these webinars, 30,000. Um, there's a version in Spanish. The entire class is in Spanish, and some of the videos have been done in Spanish. Um, and so we realize that in a lot of areas, there's a um, fairly significant uh, Spanish-speaking community on private wells. Excuse me. <clears throat> and so that's all available. Even all the figures and stuff have all been redone. Um, we're fortunate we had a PhD student in civil engineering from Columbia 
who uh, was interested in the work we were doing and helped us with all of that. Um, along with each lesson, there's a series of other resources. So like for the lesson one is called the science of groundwater and you can go to the resource library page and you can find lesson one, click on that and it'll give you these, uh, all these resources for lesson one. And there's one for all 10. And I'm mentioning that now because lesson 10 has a document from the Minnesota Department of Health on um, how to properly shock chlorinate or disinfect your well. And it's the one we recommend based on the 50 or so we've looked at and, and what it provides as far as how easy it is to use for a well owner, <coughs> excuse me, uh, and all that sort of thing. Um, we do webinars like today, the one we did last in June. Um, I had COVID, so we didn't do the July one. But um, the one we did in June was, uh, is my water safe to drink? It's Now it's on our webpage. You can um, go to our webinars and events and see all the past ones. And um, and then you can watch that information. And again, once we go through some of the questions at the end, you'll understand a lot of these videos, um, like is my water safe to drink? We do two or three times a year. But th at the end, where we answer the questions, a lot of times those are very different. So if you're trying to get a, a more robust knowledge of things, besides watching the entire webinar, each one of them we do, you can go back to all of the webinars for the questions and you're gonna learn more uh, based on what people might have asked us that month. Um, we haven't done this since 2018 because we had an expert, Dr. Kelsey Piper from Northeastern, who's done a lot of work with lead in private wells. But this really explains the lead issue for private well owners. And again, it's not um, an issue of lead being in the water in an aquifer. It's about all the lead pipes uh, or pipes with lead in them or galvanized pipe that has lead in it, whether that be in the well in some areas where the water is really aggressive um, or in the home um, where, you know, any home before 1984 has at least lead solder, actually before 2014 has lead solder, um, depending on the state, um, as late as 1984, there were straight lead pipes. And so understanding whether you have them, and again, having lead pipes doesn't mean they're leaching lead. It's likely, but it depends on the water chemistry, whether it's actually leaching lead out of those pipes or not. So it's really worthwhile to understand and um, regardless if you have someone with lead pipes in their home um, or even copper pipes that have been soldered with lead solder from before say 2014, it's worth getting a water sample done for lead uh, just to be sure and, and understand. Uh, we also have a resource page for lead. So it's just privateoilclass.org slash lead, um, which takes you to things like for water filters that you can use on your kitchen tap and things like that. And um, we have 21 training videos. This says 16 because this is an older slide, but there's 21 of these. You know, what is a sand and gravel aquifer? How does, uh, um, what do I do after a flood? And one of them is, what should I know about a shared private well? Um, I highlight this, uh, we did get a question. Uh, and so I'm gonna answer that now basically by talking about this. But um, you know, a shared well in most states it's considered a private water supply if it's less than 15 homes and 25 people on that water supply. So you can have a subdivision with 10 homes and it's not considered a public water supply even though everybody's using one well. Um, what we run into is a lot of places where there's two or three homes on a well, that well is on one person's property and there's no agreement between the three homeowners on sharing expenses or resources related to that well. Um, in most cases, the person who owns the well has complete control. There is no agreement. Maybe they have a nice agreement, a gentleman's agreement, if you will, a uh, handshake, but then they sell the property to somebody else who comes in and decides they don't wanna share the well. Um, you need to have an agreement in place, whether if it's not in the deed uh, that specifies you'll do this or whatever, um, or you don't have a separate contract with the homeowners that you're gonna share expenses, what ends up happening is a pump fails and you find out it's gonna be $4,000 to replace that pump. And now one of the homeowners doesn't have, you know, the $1,300 uh, to put in their share. Now your neighbors for the last 15 years all of a sudden aren't so neighborly and you have a lot of issues. What I recommend is that you have um, a written agreement. I even suggest to people when they ask, 
that everyone pay a water bill and set up an account that so that when that pump fails, there's already money in the bank uh, to fix it because a well, like everything else, is a mechanical, and the pump especially is a mechanical device, it will eventually fail. And so um, being proactive again um, is important. I had a homeowner call me uh, not too long ago who said, um, you know, we share a well with three other people. One of them just started irrigating with our well, the well we share, uh, six acres of nursery crops. And that because of that, we have really low water pressure. We have all these other issues. And I just asked one question. I said, whose property is the well on? And the guy said, mine. And so I said, well, if you don't have any kind of a written agreement and it's not in, in the deeds to your properties or any of those things, you can you own the well. You could I mean, it's not very neighborly. I'd try to work out an agreement, but you have the right to do whatever you want. It's your well. And so, um, you know, the most states don't regulate below 15 homes and 25 people to be as a public water supply. Washington state does. If there's even two homes on a well, they have a special class of public water supply, um, I believe. And there may be other states that have some rules. I think New York may have some rule over five or 10. I can't remember what it is. But um, getting to the sh shared well issue is, uh, there's a lot more problems and there's a lot more of them than I ever realized before we started this program eight years ago. So um, yeah, anyway, a uh, lot to deal with there. Uh, another one we have, why does my well keep losing pressure? Or um, another analogous one is how does my pressure tank work? Um, that particular video, how does my pressure tank work has had um, over 400,000 views in the last five or six years. And what that tells us is that a lot of people in private wells have pressure problems. And that's either because they don't have their pressure switch set properly or they have an undersized system. Um, and there's just not a lot of information out there for them. And so uh, there's some useful tips and things in here and um, hopefully beneficial. Um, oh, wow. Look what I did, Katie. I left our old podcast. Um, this isn't up anymore. So we started a podcast when we first started this program. We did the first three lessons and we did some radio interviews, um, but we don't have those available anymore because we started a new podcast. I just forgot to take out the old slide. Um, it's called Tap Talk. And it's actually, it's really meant to be about water and public health. And so uh, I don't know if you're into podcasts or not, but we've interviewed people from, uh, you know, Brian Swistock is with Penn State Extension. He's retired now but he's probably the most knowledgeable private well person I've ever met. And that's, uh, that's a fact. Um, Dr. Wolf is with the Boston Children's Hospital and Harvard uh, Medical School. Uh, he's a pediatrician and deals with a lot of uh, special cases where folks, where children have health issues. And many times it ends up coming back to being related to water. Um, Eric Yegi at the bottom is with the Water Quality Association and, uh, they, you know, they work with treatment providers and they certify treatment equipment. And Dr. Gibson, uh, Jackie is with, uh, she's with North Carolina State and does a lot of work with private well owners and environmental justice issues. Um, there's been 24. Some of these are more on the public water side, but they're all kind of at the intersection of water and public health. Um, if you're interested in that stuff, it's, um, we've interviewed a lot of really neat people and uh, learned a lot from them. Uh, over the last uh, year and a half or so. Um, we also have a partners, it's not really a partners program per se. If you sign up, if you go to the partners page and you sign up, you'll get our newsletter, which um, I'll talk about here. I'll show you a picture of it too. Um, it comes out once a month. It's meant to be for, not for well owners, but for people who work with well owners. So a lot of times it's a, it's a document or a video or um, something that's going on around the country related to private wells. And it's information that a professional can use uh, just to help them gain more knowledge and, and things like that. So, for instance, I mentioned we did that well sealing demonstration. This is that well. Um, this is a newsletter from 2017 when we did that work. But Katie actually brought a camera and we recorded it all. And uh, this is putting bentonite in the well to seal it. But you can see it's right next to the house. And so that we made a four to six minute video on how Illinois requires a private well to be abandoned a large diameter well and that's you know just some of the kind of things that we have there um if you go 
down that page where you signed up for the newsletter, you can get to all the past newsletters as well as some other resources we have. Um, we've had four conferences now, and those are really for well professionals, but we've recorded every presentation and made it available for free on YouTube. So I mentioned two states don't have well construction code. One of those is Pennsylvania, and we had our 2019 conference there. And this is Todd Giddings, who's a hydrologist in Pennsylvania, talking about um, one of the local ordinances he helped uh, a local watershed group develop that requires licensed drillers to drill in their area because their state legislature won't pass the rules and laws to have well construction code. They've taken it in their own hands, basically. And so this is basically how to create a local private well ordinance. And it was just meant we were then Pennsylvania. We had a lot of Pennsylvania people there. And so um, there's a lot of really useful presentations. You can look through those on our YouTube page. And if there's anything that interests you, uh, just like grout, you know, there's issues with grout that um, haven't been addressed as far as um, how much does it really seal a well and some other things. And we had someone talk about that at our 2017 conference. It's really practical information. It's what it's meant to be. Um, yeah, and we had a 2021 conference I mentioned. Um, you know, I'll just go on from there. And then we have this brochure. So we developed this, um, you know, the front side says, is your well water safe? It's a trifold. It's meant to be a thing like our idea when we first developed this was that it was something that a county health department or a local health district could sit out in front in their lobby so that people could just pick it up um, if they were there waiting for some other service or whatever. And we purposely developed this um, in a way that's generic um, so that anyone can hand it out. And uh, so it's got our information on, this is the front side. The back side talks about, you know, why you should test, follow these best practices, and then, you know, basically take our class is a good way to learn more about your well and how to solve problems. And so the idea was, again, it's pretty generic, um, but it gets people thinking about their well, why they should keep records of everything, you know, all that sort of stuff. And then um, we left this place where the big yellow rectangle is here, blank on purpose and that's so that uh, anyone who wants copies of these can stick their own label there and so um, it's actually been really successful we've uh, printed these things four times um, we probably we just printed another seven or eight thousand I think um, that we already had spoken for most of them and uh, all together we've printed over 80,000 brochures that we've given out to about 400 different entities um, you know, some of those are state agencies like uh, Indiana's uh, lab for their state lab. They put one of these in every one of the water sample results they send back to people who've had a water test. Um, extension people use them, you name it, labs. And so they're free. We ship them to you free. We provide them uh, as is, already folded, already uh, completed. And uh, it's just up to you to send, give them out to your well owners. And there's a, obviously we've also done this in Spanish. Um, if you're in an area where there's a lot of Spanish, native Spanish speakers who prefer their material that way. And the same thing, there's a big spot here where you can put a logo. And, you know, everything about our program is free, which is really a great place to be in. And we're not trying to sell anything. We're actually just trying to get more people interested in taking care of their wells. Uh, we do have a realtors page. Um, I can honestly say that I did not think about checking all the links before today's webinar, but we'll do that, or Katie will. Um, everything should be fine, but um, it's always good to check. And uh, yeah, that's really the goal of all that material. And why we're in this is to help well owners understand their wells, why they're important, why they need to know how it works, really so they can help protect themselves from risk. And so. Um, it's, you know, it's kind of a well owner 101, um, but it also helps. There's a lot of professionals that we've worked with who've learned a lot from it. It turns out um, not everyone's had uh, working with private wells in their professional position, have had a chance to take any private well classes, and they're learning on the job. And this is a one resource that's free that folks can use. So um, I'm going to go to the questions we had today, uh, well, we had in advance. And so um, I couldn't answer all the questions. I don't know how they were total, but there's always more than we can answer. But I tried to pick ones um, that we don't typically answer, except in one case. And then um, if you asked a question about your state or rules in your state, 
Um, if you would, if it doesn't come up today, it probably won't. Um, just email us and we can look into it. But um, we work in all 50 states and it makes it kind of difficult. We're a pretty small team. And so, um, yeah, and again, if you have any questions, it looks like a few of you have already asked questions, um, use the question box uh, or the chat box and on your GoToWebinar window. And Katie's watching for those and we're putting them in a Google Doc that I'll share here on screen at the end. So first question we got was, I work in a lab that services both Kentucky and Indiana. Some agents require that an outside entity collect, uh, collects the samples versus the homeowner. Some require that coliform result is quantitative versus qualitative. If you're not aware of that, um, some states require a, a yes or a no. Other states want you to quantify how much bacteria there is, and it's a plate count. Um, I think I'm a, I'm a, a convert, if you will. Um, I used to think that qualitative was fine, but I've since learned that knowing how the abundance of coliform bacteria is also an important aspect. And so if you have a choice, you should always do the quantitative. Um, so the question though is, is this based on state or local laws? How do we know uh, what the requirements are based on location? So as far as I know, neither Kentucky or Indiana have any state requirements for sampling a property sale. Um, as I mentioned, I did mention this earlier, there are some states with those rules, um, but it's likely that it's based on either the lender, the mortgage company, or the bank. Um, yeah, or it could be HUD, uh, which again gets back to your mortgage company, I guess, um, because they want to protect their uh, value of the property. And so they want to know beforehand. And HUD's actually really changed their rules over the years. And I'm going to show a couple slides I've shown the last several times we've done this because it's really important because so many loans end up being through HUD, FHA, or uh, VA um, that I think it's worth talking about, especially with this group. So what the rules say now for HUD testing and, and FHA and VA follow the same rules is that the mortgagee must confirm that a connection is made to a public or community water system whenever feasible or available to reasonable cost. So if you're close to a public water system um, and we see cases where there's public water across the street, um, you're actually better off trying in many cases trying to convince the homeowner that they should just work with the local public water supply and run a line under the road. Um, we had that case here where um, they built enough subdivisions south of Champaign-Urbana that um, this home that had been out in the country is now has a subdivision across the street from it. It's the shallow aquifer in that area has high arsenic. And so before they bought their home, they tested and um, the people had, well, no, they didn't. Um, it tested at 78 parts per billion, I think, which again, the standard is only 10. It was a young couple, they were thinking about having kids, and so they were gonna have to add treatment. So I suggested they contact our water supplier, our public water supply, and see if they had water all the way out there, and sure enough, they did. So I think they paid like $6,500 for a connection, which is you know a fair amount of money uh, for sure, but um, it means they don't have to test, they don't have to add you know, an RO unit or some other kind of device that they have to maintain and test frequently to make sure it's working right, uh, to make sure they're not drinking arsenic that's at an unacceptable level. And so um, that's why HUD put this in there because it's, uh, it guarantees there won't be any water quality issues if they're on a community water supply. And so if, it, if it's not reasonable, then um, you can have a public, you can have a, um, it says provided they are functioning properly and meet the requirements of a local health department. So that's where we get into trouble here. Um, so first you have to connect to a public water supply. If you can't, then you have to make sure your well is working properly, has enough water, and it meets the requirements of local health department. Well, how many local health departments have requirements? Very few uh, nationwide. And so here's what else it says then. When an individual water supply system is present, the mortgagee must ensure that the water quality meets the requirements of a health authority with jurisdiction. If there are no local or state water quality standards, then the water quality must meet the standards set by the EPA as presented in the National Primary Drinking Water Regulations. So that those are the Safe Drinking Water Act regulations. So that means you have to test for everything. You have to test for beryllium. 
you have to test for all these things that you would never expect to find in normal quote um, groundwater or well water because it must meet all those standards. No one does this. You guys that are actually doing any of this work know that no one samples for all those things. Um, and so a lot of it just not monitored per se. And so when you look at the national primary drinking water regulations, there's a lot of stuff. I'm, you know, this is seven or eight things that are just, or nine things uh, that are just into the bees. Uh, there's, I don't remember how many primary drinking water regulations there are, but there's a lot. Some of them aren't even, uh, you know, like algal uh, toxins. That's a surface water problem. Um, you know, so it's really poorly worded. And, and so because of that, what's happened is um, I had someone send this to me, an old copy, saying that these are this, this, di this diagram down at the bottom, um, minimum water quality testing parameters for HUD, US EPA drinking water recommendations for private water quality testing. So this is a complete list. You test for lead, nitrate, nit nitrite, uh, total coliforms and fecal coliforms or E. coli, um, and you're good. And so there's a mortgage company in Michigan that had this on their website. I searched high and low and finally found it. Um, this came out of a mortgagee letter from HUD in 1994. It was superseded in 2001, which means it's no longer active and no longer the rule. Um, somebody made a copy of it, made a nice PDF, and they put it out there on the web. Um, this does not meet HUD's requirements. HUD's requirements were the thing I just read to you. Uh, and so there is no list. It's based on local jurisdiction, state jurisdiction, or if none of those exist, then the EPA public water supply requirements. And so there's a lot of things not done properly, which, you know, which is why some groups and some uh, lenders and others have uh, require you to test for certain things. That's what they feel uh, should be the list. There is no national list, if you will. I think there needs to be. Um, I've tried really hard to reach HUD uh, over the last several years uh, to talk about this issue, and so far I haven't been successful. But there needs to be some something done to standardize this around the country. Um, so let's move on. There are are there repercussions for a homeowner if they are told the water is quote fine with no treatment when the tests clearly show there were exceedances to be addressed? So what I'm assuming is that. Someone bought a home, they said, oh, our, our water's fine. And then after they bought the home and purchased it, they tested it and found that there was a problem. So uh, I already mentioned the form in Illinois. You know, there's a form the seller has to fill out that's legally binding. So as far as what to do about that, it really depends on what state you're in. You know, in some states you couldn't even do that because the state requires a test. But um, in Illinois, you have this form you have to fill out. So if they fill it out, I know there's been cases where someone filled it out that the water's there were no issues, and then clearly there were issues that there's no way they didn't know about it. Um, but then you have to prove that. You have to be able to prove they knew about the issue or they you have it in writing that they said it was fine. Um, and so um, I don't know. That's a tricky slope that I really can't walk down um, as far as what the best solution there is because it really depends on your state and you probably need to talk to a lawyer. Um, because that's really where the problems are going to be. And I already told you the arsenic example about the guy who didn't want to know. Um, but that's why those things are there. So um, hopefully your state realtor association would have some idea. Um, if not, then I would talk to uh, the folks at the state who regulate those things. Um, because it is, unfortunately, it's different in every state. And you're going to get a different answer depending on where you live. Um, are there organizations, municipal agencies that routinely provide testing for such as depth to water, total depth, quality yield, blah, 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 et cetera? Um, are there township or county records of such information on wells within the municipality that are accessible to the general public? So it depends on the state again, right? Um, in Illinois, drillers have to file a permit and a log with the county. Then when they get the log, they send a copy to the state water survey. We have all the well records for every county in one place. Um, by law, which is, I would say is a totally stupid law, uh, the county health departments in Illinois are only required to keep records for 10 years. So after 10 years, they can toss them. Um, most, I don't think, do that, but I know a few that have told me they do. 
And so they lose that information, which, you know, wells last a lot longer than 10 years. And so that's an, uh, an issue. As far as the depth to water, total depth um, and yield, typically, if you don't know that information, it's going to require a drilling contractor to, to figure that out for you. They'll have to pump the well, probably pull a pump and put a bigger pump in, um, test the depth of water just by dropping a tape down. Uh, the total depth should be on a log again. And it, again, most of this is here if you have the well log, like the one I showed before. I think I'm going to show it again. Um, but even in some states, there's rules about who can even open the well. You, maybe the homeowner can, and then it has to be a contractor. You can't have somebody, just anybody come out. I know in Arizona, I work uh, with a guy who uh, was a driller, and now he does mostly work for people with private wells as a hydrologist, and they have requirements like guaranteeing yield. It's impossible to do. Um, so hopefully, you, if you can find a log, it has more information. But regarding quality, um, water quality can change. You can take a sample two years ago, and especially for a shallow or unconfined well, if it's uh, susceptible to surface runoff or surface contamination, it can be very different the next time you sample, depending on what's happened. It could be different if it rained hard uh, the two days before. We actually had that happen where someone sent us a sample. And, you know, you can tell the difference between surface water and groundwater in the lab if you are used to seeing those samples. And our lab guys came back and said, hey, this is mostly rainwater. This isn't groundwater. And so, you know, that means they have direct influence from the surface on their well, which is bad. That means anything that their water picks up and running into the well is going to go in there. So it also depends on well type and construction. Is it properly sealed at the surface? All those things as far as water quality goes. Um, what's nearby? You know, a lot of times when we have... Uh, e. coli problem that won't go away even after shock chlorination several times is because there's a direct uh, influence from a feedlot for livestock or it's too close to a septic system. So, it, you know, it's very site specific in some cases. And as far as yield and level, um, it's a representative point in time because groundwater, um, you know, it's if if a new water supply went in or an irrigation system went in nearby, it could dramatically affect the water levels in your well. And so uh, you may, uh, that sample, uh, the water level may have been measured in the winter um, and it was, you know, say 100 feet. Well, then somebody goes back uh, and they're having problems with their pump in the summer of the next year after they bought the property and it turns out there's an irrigation well that's in the same aquifer that's only, you know, three or 400 yards away or more and it's lowered the water levels another 60 to 100 feet. Um, and I, Rocky Ford is a quarry near where I grew up. Um, a guy who had had a house and a well there for 30 years, all of a sudden his well went dry. And it's because this quarry had moved close enough and expanding to his property um, that they were dewatering their, uh, for quarry, for getting gravel and stuff, they were dewatering the area and it made his well go dry. Uh, and then, you know, I mentioned the irrigation thing already, that certainly a, a high capacity water use, a well can really change the dynamic nearby uh, whenever it's pumping. Because yeah, sometimes those are pulling, you know, 1,000 or 2,000 gallons a minute. And depending on how prolific the aquifer is, that could be drawdown of 10 feet or 100 feet um, and, and affect private wells. So it's really a tricky thing to say this is the yield uh, too, just because it's not a static thing. It's not always going to be the same. And I know there's a few states that have laws about that. And that's, you know, that's, again, the hydrologist in Arizona I mentioned really struggles with, you know, signing anything because it's not a guarantee. It just isn't. So I'm um, going back to the Algonquin, uh, Camp Algonquin example, uh, just to show you, you know, there's, there is a lot of information on here um, related to, uh, the water levels um, and all that stuff, no water quality data, but if you can find a log, obviously that helps. And so we have a tool online that the State Geological Survey does where you can look at the whole state and as you zoom in, it shows you all the wells that exist. So I circled the well that is at Alg Camp Algonquin and you can see right in the center of the picture where the houses are for this camp. It's along the Fox River up in McHenry County in Illinois, which is up by Chicago. And so they have this deep well, 
um, and you can look at all the well logs. So if I click on that, it tells me that it's, you know, it has an ID number for the API is the ge geological surveys number and the P number is the water surveys number, uh, who drilled it, some basic things. But I click on more info, it pulls up this generated log. So they input all the geo survey and puts all this stuff in a database. And then um, when you click on that, it, it basically puts it in this form. This doesn't have as much information, excuse me, as the original log that I showed you earlier, but it's got a lot of the same basic information and useful stuff, you know, the type of casing, the size of the casing, the water levels, uh, all that stuff. So it's uh, a number of states have tools like this, and so it's certainly worth looking. And one of the other questions was about county versus local versus the state having this information. You know, 10 years ago, or before 2016, the only way to get a well log in California was for the owner of the well to contact the county health department and they would give you a, a log. And I know that because I had a well owner ask me for some information. I said I needed the log and I called the county and they said they can't give it to me. He had to get it. So he got it. He faxed it to me. Well, then they had all these issues with the drought and wells going dry and they passed legislation that make all that stuff public information. Now, I can go on a website in California and see every log that's out there, everyone they've ever had a record for and all the information. And so um, it really depends on the state and what their resources are, um, how aggressive they've been at ensuring drillers file logs. There's a lot of things that go into what data is available. Um, and all you can do is look uh, and see what you can find. So PFAS removal, that's the big topic of the, gonna be for the next many years, I think. Um, so the good news is, you know, so what's the best way to address PFAS contamination in well water? You know, there are ways to treat PFAS chemicals, at least some of them. It's not known how many this works for, and I'm not a PFAS expert, but granular activated carbon filtration, reverse osmosis, or ion exchange all work. And again, there's still a lot to be learned, and there's a ton of research going on. Um, a lot of sampling, you know, and you keep seeing, um, you, originally EPA came out with a health advisory of 70 parts per trillion for PFOA and PFOS. Um, those were the first two that were really studied a lot. You know, there's literally hundreds of others that they're working on. Um, and we do learn more almost every day. There's stuff out. But um, when I got on, I mentioned uh, there's third party certifiers that certify treatment equipment. Um, really, most of them certify equipment only for PFOA and PFOS, which are two of many. Um, but again, that list will expand over time. So when I say third-party certifier, um, for treatment equipment, whenever you look up treatment equipment for, say, for arsenic removal, you're going to see a set of, of different types of treatment equipment that are say two or $300, and then you're gonna see a set that are seven or $800, and then you might see some that are even way more expensive than that. Uh, the two or $300 ones likely have not been certified to remove the chemical they're supposed to. Um, there's a process um, that things have to go through, and one thing I wanna make sure and say, which I think I have another slide on, is you should only buy treatment equipment, and your customers, your clients should only buy treatment equipment that is certified to remove what you're trying to remove because otherwise you might be buying something that doesn't actually do what it's supposed to. And so it's worth spending more money uh, rather than going the cheap route and getting something that actually doesn't work. So as far as the types of these, I know I mentioned the three types of uh, actual treatment, but they come as you can either plumb them in as filters in line. Um, some are water pitchers that have a, a, a filter, GAC filter or something like that. Uh, in the pitcher, or there's others that are point of use that typically you, you run a separate line under your kitchen sink to a, a third uh, or a second uh, spigot, if you will, uh, and that has this treatment. It goes through the treatment under your sink first, like you see that with RO units. Um, and the good news is the same uh, things that remove PFOA and PFOS also remove a lot of other things. They meet ANSI standards 58 and 53, which I know remove arsenic. Um, and so that's why I mentioned same devices can remove other contaminants. So I went to the Water Quality Association, which is one of the three certifiers, and I'll give you more on that. And the only two they listed down at the bottom under their advanced search was PFOA and PFOS. 
So when I searched for that, um, what it gave me, I'll go to the next slide, is down this page, further down this page, is a list of companies and the type of equipment they have and what models they have and all that stuff. And so you can see, uh, like the clearly filtered is a water pitcher, it's a filter, and it's only listed for uh, PFOA and PFOS. But some of the others, like the one below it, the Conway Limited one is an RO unit. And so it's, you know, it's it goes, it's countertop, but it's plumbed into a line under your sink. And it also removes arsenic, barium, cadmium, and there's a whole list. You know, RO removes a lot of things. It's a, it's a barrier, it's a membrane that only lets certain things through. And so, um, you know, they're going to all vary in cost, but again, they all say here they meet ANSI NSF standard 58 or 53, um, which is really all these probably should remove arsenic unless, um, I don't know those rules that well. It might be that NSF ANSI standard 53 is for filters, and it doesn't mean that everyone does all of those things. So um, it's good to read up on that and talk to a treatment professional if you're gonna get into that, uh, into these things. So I mentioned there's three treatment certifiers. They're NSF, which isn't the National uh, Science Foundation. In this case, it's the National Sanitation Foundation, which if you notice, it was NSF ANSI standards. They work with uh, ANSI, which I can't remember what that stands for, but it's a, you know, they develop the standards on what the equipment should be able to do to meet their requirements. And then the three certifiers, NSF, UL, which is Underwriters Lab, and WQA, the Water Quality Association, they test equipment to meet those standards and it has to pass that. So it has to remove a certain percentage or a certain amount or get it below a certain value, whatever the standard might say, um, in order to get that stamp of approval. And so I would not buy um, any treatment equipment that doesn't have one of these three symbols and it says it also has leather language that it's certified for that particular constituent, like arsenic or PFOA or whatever it might be. And um, that's a really important thing. And we talk about that in our private well class lesson 10 as well and describe some things in more detail there. Um, I want to talk, several people asked about bacteria. You know, they, I wanted to mention that um, when you have trouble with bacteria, even after you've disinfected, um, that it's because the effects of chlorine really can be different on bacteria, the well components, even geology, it can be really complicated. Um, if there's a continuous source, which I mentioned like a septic or a feedlot, or there's a breach in the casing, then it may not matter. It may be that the chlorine may work and kill the bacteria in your system for just a short time and then they'll come back. And in that case, really uh, your options are a new well or add continuous disinfection, which is either a, add continuous chlorine, like a city does, right? Um, homes on a public water system have chlorine in the distribution system, um, or UV, ultraviolet lights, another way to kill um, those things. And so that's really your only options. Um, and if you've not ever used chlorine before, and it's been many years, bacteria can form biofilms and grow in layers. And a lot of those may be harmless, like iron bacteria or sulfate reducing bacteria, which may cause a smell, um, but they don't necessarily, they're not harmful as a health concern. But then those biofilms can harbor other pathogenic bacteria. And so um, I think there was a question about how many times, you know, I would try three or four times before I gave up because every time you're breaking a layer out of those biofilms um, and what'll happen is you know, if you when you do this right, you you circulate water with chlorine in it through your whole system and uh, through your well, and then you run it through your home. At every tap, you should smell chlorine and then shut it off and let it sit overnight. Well, if there's a particular piece of uh, pipe that has a lot of biofilm or bacteria on the wall or whatever, it may use up that chlorine right away, and so. Um, sitting there eight hours doesn't help that like it might in other places um, if there's a lot that it's trying to kill so to speak right um, and so doing it a number of times is necessary uh, in those cases and so um, it's you know there's other folks that are uh, that do this for a living that probably have better advice but it's just you know there's when there's layers of bacteria and biofilms which because private wells aren't chlorinated like 
public water system dis distribution lines are, there's likely more biofilms and bacteria uh, that are not harmful, the harmful kind in home plumbing and you know the lines that serve from the well to the home than people realize. Um, I don't know that for a fact, but it seems likely just because there's no back, no chlorine uh, in the system to kill anything that might start growing. And the other thing to note is above a pH of eight, chlorine can be uh, ineffective. And so if the if you don't if you know the pH of the water and it's high, um, it doesn't matter how much chlorine you're putting in there, it's just not going to be that effective. And uh, there are folks working on alternative approaches. I know there's anecdotally people put vinegar in a well to lower the pH before they add the chlorine. Um, you know, I I don't know anything about that, and I know I don't think there are any quote standards for doing that. And so I don't know how effective that might be. But um, you know, there's other potential options. Uh, hydrogen peroxide uh, is one that uh, we're starting to see some of, but I don't know a lot about that either. But and uh, in a normal case, just for disinfecting a well, shock chlorine in it, um, in our lesson 10, one of the links is to the Minnesota Department of Health's shock chlorination guide. And uh, put the link below. It's just lesson-10 to get to those resources. And then one of them's from MDH. And that's the one we would recommend using for any, you know, just, we know we want to shock chlorinate the well. We had a positive coliform hit, you know, just to do one time. Um, that's the approach we would follow. Okay, <clears throat> can you sell water from your well? Well, um, I really don't know an answer to that other than I know bottled water has to meet FDA regs. It's considered a food. So if that's your angle, I don't know what the angle is here. Um, but, you know, if it's community water supply, it has to meet the requirements of the Safe Drinking Water Act. Um, and so it really depends on, um, you know, a public water supply is technically selling water to residents too. Um, but if this is a private well situation, then it really depends on what the purpose is, how you're using it. Um, there may be some other requirements in Western states because of water rights. You have a right to use the water you need, but I'm not sure you have the right to sell it um, because your water right is for your use. And uh, being from Illinois, I don't know enough about those issues, but there's certainly people that ask uh, in Western states where that's part of the rule, you know, the rule of law first right. And so, you know, again, if it's to a neighbor because um, they don't want to drill their own well, then, you know, one, there's an expectation of potable water. Uh, you know, to me, it doesn't seem like a great way to make some extra money, but I don't know the actual purpose. Um, but, yeah, I think it really just depends on what the situation is. Um, never been asked that question. Um, I would think, you know, if it's to share a well, yeah, I don't know. I guess you probably could, but I'm not sure. Um, could you discuss the various filter systems used in drilled wells? We had a 200-foot, 6-inch diameter well with a 4-inch diameter inner pipe surrounded by a sand filter pack. Uh, this arrangement was incapable of stopping the contamination of our water supply by the finest black silt in existence. Somebody's frustrated. I get it. Um, so it's interesting because it sounds like you had a 6-inch well. And I'm assuming that's a sand and gravel well with a screen. And then you put a four inch well inside of it so that you could put, and because of the silt, you had to put a four inch well inside of it. And then you put gravel pack that's much finer with a finer screen inside of that, hoping it would stop the silt. Um, the only thing I read is that a five, you know, normally you put in a five micron filter to catch anything that's a solid uh, in water, anything, you know, it's going to cause turbidity or whatever. But I did read where it may be. Uh, some fine silt may be small enough to get through a micron filter. And so um, if it is finer than that, then they do make one micron filters. And there's also alternative types of devices that are more expensive that would basically um, coagulate all that and, and backwash it out. That's a, that's a real treatment system. And I don't know enough about them. I just looked at that for today. Um, you'd need to talk to a treatment professional. Um, but you know, and a lot of people have five micron filters on their systems just because um, if there's any air induced at all, we have so much iron in our groundwater that that's uh, forming iron oxide. And then that five micron filter will take that out. So you're not getting all the rust in your porcelain and all that stuff uh, and in your toilet. Um, so a one micron filter might be an option. You know, the smaller the, the microns on the filter, the more pressure it takes to push it through. 
And so as the filters get smaller, um, it may affect your water pressure to some degree um, or make your energy costs go up a little bit more. Um, I don't have those details, but that makes sense uh, as an engineer that it could be that way. Um, but you know, your best bet is to talk to a treatment specialist. Um, you can find, I know the Water Quality Association has a program for, um, it's like a certificate program for treatment professionals. And from that, you can find um, treatment professionals in your area on their website um, that have went through those classes and uh, have signed stuff for ethics and all those other things. It's probably worth uh, taking a look there. So with that, um, we have a number of questions. So I'm gonna drop this down real quick. It's almost three. Um, and let me pull this over and make it full screen. Okay, so question one. Um, my question is about the Great, uh, Great Lakes Community Action Partnership that was discussed earlier. I was wondering if those free well inspections they do were sufficient for a real estate transaction. Um, they're not meant for that. Um, I do know that um, there's two national organizations for um, well ins for home inspectors that are part of those things. And one of those groups contacted us about setting up a class for their members. And because we already have the class on NEHA's website for EHPs um, and it's free, um, they actually take our class through that. And I know that's not your question, um, but um, you know, these are meant to be actually provided to the well owner and no one else. Um, and it's you know, obviously the well owner is free to share how they want, but um, it's not, that's not what they're meant for. Um, whether they would work for that or not, you know, I don't know what's required for a real estate transaction. So it'd be a matter of comparing what's on the real estate form and what's in the assessment tool and if you email us, we can give you a link on our website to uh, that assessment tool, at least the, the fillable PDF. You can take a look at it because it's free to anyone who wants it. It's just you really have to have some wherewithal to actually fill it out. Uh, there's a lot of questions that are, you know, the idea is uh, you have a, someone who's you know, sort of a well expert or at least have pretty knowledgeable about wells who can sit down with a well owner and go through the entire assessment form and answer their questions as you go and you know explain what backflow devices are, you know, all those things um, so that they have a better understanding of their well and what can affect their well whenever you're done. So it's meant to be an education and outreach tool, but um, yeah, you're more than welcome to email us and take a look. Uh, so where does arsenic come from? Well, it's naturally occurring. I, I mentioned um, it's, uh, I'm sorry. Um, yeah, it's a very common element in the Earth's crust. It's just naturally there. Uh, you can have contamination, usually from the surface, like I mentioned that happened in Rhode Island. But in general, um, I know there's a number of states where arsenic is not an issue, but probably in well over half, um, there's naturally occurring arsenic in some of the aquifers. In our case, um, we have an aquifer that's sand and gravel that has some arsenio pyrite in it. And when the chemistry is right, um, it gets released from that and is in the water and it's actually uh, depends on how reducing the water conditions are and the chemistry, whether the arsenic stays bound uh, to the gran uh, granular material or it gets released in the water. Um, and so it's, it's just naturally there. It's common, as I said, and yeah, um, and it's driven by how much comes out. It's driven by the chemistry. It's just, you know, it's part of the makeup of the Earth's crust. Hi, Katie and Steven. Why use black steel pipe at the base of casing? Black steel is typically not used for potable water distribution. Um, you know, it must be acceptable in Illinois for uh, well construction, or it wouldn't be, um, or it was at the time. I think that well is from 1980. Um, and so uh, it depends on what our code said then. But yeah, they, you know, our drillers, actually, we were very fortunate in Illinois where we have, and so do our, our state has a good uh, rep, um, good dialogue with our drillers, work together in a lot of things. So 
Um, if it's not acceptable, depends on your state, maybe. I don't know. I don't have an answer for you other than, um, you know, that's what they filed on the log. Um, and it obviously is the well casing. So uh, does a water softener using salt help purify? Well, um, you know, it's basically reducing the hardness, right? So it's, it's, it's uh, ion exchange. Uh, it's transferring some ions for um, others to make the water softer. But um, with our lab, we have access to data. A lot of times, um, not as much today, but you know, 15 years ago and before that, we asked a lot of folks to collect two samples, one from um, an outside spigot that's before any kind of treatment or close to the wells possible, so that's more of a groundwater sample, and then one at their kitchen tap, which is more of their drinking water sample. And what we found is that, um, you know, softeners can remove iron sometimes, whether they're meant to or not, um, and they can also remove arsenic sometimes. We had some cases where it removed half the arsenic that was in the water from the outside sample to the inside sample and others where it didn't remove any. And so it's not rated for those things necessarily, but sometimes you get side benefits like that. And so I don't know if that answers your question. Um, it's really not meant to quote purify and that's a really vague term. Um, it's, it's meant to exchange ions so that the water's not as hard and you know, your soap works better and all those things. So, um, yeah. Is, is there other ways besides testing that, will, that will, I will know if my well is going empty or about the yield? Um, you know, you can measure your own water levels. Um, it, it's trying to understand, um, they make little sonic probes that, you know, they shoot a sound wave down and come back up and it depends on uh, how accurate those are. Um, it's questionable sometimes, but if you're, Measuring a bunch of times over time, the idea is to understand if it's going up or down or how it's changing. Um, you know, we use still tape still once in a while, but I wouldn't do that in anybody else as well unless I disinfected it first. And um, yeah, I, I, otherwise I don't know other than, you know, you can, um, you can turn on your everything on at once and let it run for several hours and see if you run out of water. That's a scary thought. But um, in theory, when you shut off your well, it would come back because you're you're drawing down inside the well, then the areas outside of your well in the aquifer are at a higher water level. And so it's pushing water towards your well. Um, but other than putting a big pump in and pumping it, uh, I don't know how else to go about it. So. Yeah, there's no if there was an easier way, people would surely do it. So. How about disinfecting the softener with a cup of bleach and see what happens? Disinfecting the softener. I'm not sure what this is in relation to. Um, yeah, so the thing I could tell you about a cup of bleach, I had a well owner tell me, well, their contractor told them just to pour a cup of bleach down their well once a month. Um, And that does nothing. So um, you need to mix the chlorine when you're disinfecting your well. And the idea is you, um, I don't understand what disinfecting the softener with a cup of bleach does. Um, if you just put it in the softener so that it's running through your house, you don't know where the bacteria is coming from. It could be in your pipes, it could be in the well, it could be in the drop pipe. Um, and so to really disinfect your system, you have to, so what you do is you, um, you have to measure the depth, of, you know the depth of your well, how much water's in it. Then from that, you can calculate how much chlorine to add so that when you mix it, it's at the right concentration. And then you basically circulate it. So you run a hose back into your well, turn on the hose, and you run water through it for a while so that it's going in a circle, right? and it mixes the water up so all the water is at the same concentration, then you shut that off and you run water in every toilet, shower, sink, every opening in your home until you smell chlorine, you shut it off and you do that last thing before you go to bed and then you leave it overnight 
and letting, you know, the contact time with the bacteria is important for killing it. And so the, the chlorine needs to have a certain amount of contact time in order to do its job. Um, I've not heard of um, putting a cup of bleach in the softener. I'm not sure what that would do. What I do know is uh, chlorine is a oxidant. And just like in a well, you don't pour straight chlorine into a well. You mix it first because uh, as an oxidant, it will release metals from anything it touches. So 5% chlorine, um, if you have brass on your pump or you have galvanized pipe for your drop pipe, you're going to leach lead off of those pipes uh, or the brass um, if you pour straight chlorine in anything. So if there's anything in your softener that's got lead solder or which it likely does, it's copper pipes inside there, um, you're going to be leaching materials um, and eventually that will corrode and, and uh, affect your system. So, yeah, I'm trying to think. Um, for repeated bacterial contamination, I don't see how that, if it's repeated, either way, you don't know. If you're only putting it into softener, if it's behind that, you're not going to do any make any difference. You need to do the whole system. So that would be my best advice. Okay. Um, well, thanks for everyone's time. We went over a little bit. I apologize for that. And um, if you have any other questions, you can email us at private well, uh, info at privatewellclass.org. And uh, yeah, thanks for attending.